Thank you for that. Jesus is worthy. Amen. Oh, goodness. Big passage this morning. We are not going to go verse by verse this morning. Just want to go through this a little bit and pull out a few things as we prepare for the Lord's Supper today. As we look at this first passage when the crowd is, is shouting Hosanna and waving palm branches and other, uh, the other account, Math Matthew's account tells us that they lay out cloaks for him. Oh my goodness, they are counting him worthy. Their praise is a little misguided, but they are counting him worthy. And so let's jump into that as we look at verses 12 through 19 here. It was Passover time. And those of you who are familiar with uh, this time of the year and the Jewish celebrations, this was the time that the Jews celebrated. It was a yearly celebration of God sparing the Hebrew firstborns way back, you know, when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt. And God was like, okay, it's time for y'all to get out. You've got to be, be, become a nation. Uh, so Pharaoh let my people go. He sent Moses to to let his people out of Egypt and sent these plagues and Pharaoh just wouldn't, he was stubborn and he wouldn't let them go. I mean, why would he want to let a people who were his slaves go? And so God said, okay, the death of the firstborn is going to come. And uh, anybody who's, who's not, who doesn't have the blood of the, uh, of the lamb over the doorpost, the firstborn in that household is going to die. And so the Hebrews, they had the blood over the doorpost, and when death came, they were spared, but not those in Egypt. And so Pharaoh just said, go, get out of here, get out of here. He changed his mind again, though, <laughs> chased them to the Red Sea. And then we have the parting of the Red Sea, and the people were saved, and the Egyptian army was, was killed. They wandered in the wilderness, but they eventually became a nation. And so here they are. It's that time of the year where the Jews are remembering that. And they're celebrating. So at a time, this is so key, at a time when thoughts of God's past deliverance were being celebrated, surely hopes of the promised Messiah that, Jew, that the Jews had. Hey, there's a Messiah that's going to come. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to save his people. He's going to defeat his enemies. He's going to restore Israel back to her prominence. Now Israel is, in, is being oppressed by Rome, but they're looking forward to a Messiah that's going to bring his kingdom. Surely, at this time of Passover, when remembering God's past deliverance, they're celebrating that. Surely his future deliverance, the thoughts of that are at a fever pitch. And those hopes of a promised Messiah found their focus on Jesus as that hopeful Messiah. We know this by how they responded. They quote a passage, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Psalm 18. This is a psalm of thanksgiving and victory for he who comes in the name of the Lord they called out Hosanna. Hosanna means save now. It means bring prosperity now. They want Jesus to save them now. They're looking for Rome to be defeated. They wave palm branches. Palm branches became national symbols of victory and celebration. And so they're waving them. Here comes victory. Here comes celebration. They, they, they lay out their cloaks for him, Matthew 21 tells us. This is a token of homage to royalty. They call him the king of Israel. They call him the son of David. Matthew tells us that too. These are titles for Messiah. And this crowd who went out to meet Jesus as he came into Jerusalem, they were hailing him as Messiah. And sometime before this, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And the crowds that saw that happen spread the word about that miracle. And this Passover crowd heard about it. So they went out to meet him. If he could raise a man who had been dead for four days, surely he could defeat Rome. 
So they applied the words of Psalm 18 to the Messiah, he who came in the name of the Lord. So they called out for Jesus to save them now, to bring Israel's promised prosperity now, to defeat Rome and establish the long-awaited kingdom. And unlike so many times before, when Jesus would tamp down this type of activity that would highlight attention on him as Messiah, here he welcomes it. He lets them flock to him in worship as he rides a donkey into town. Why does he do this? Well, other than being worthy of this worship, his, his hour had come. He said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He knew this, that welcoming this worship, and not only welcoming it, but facilitating it by such a procession, a public display of worship, he knew that this, this, this public display of worship of him as Messiah would force the Pharisees to move, to act, to arrest him, and to kill him. He knew this would prompt them to say, this is enough. Everybody's going to him. This is enough. We got we to get rid of him. He knew it. And according to God's timetable, the time for that had come. At various other times, Throughout Scripture, he said that his time or his hour, his appointed time or his hour had not come yet. We find this in John 2, 4, John 7, 6, John uh, 7, 8, John 30, John 8, 20. He says, my hour has not come. My time has not come. But now on God's timetable, it was here. So many other times they wanted to kill him, but he didn't allow it because it wasn't his hour yet. Matthew 12, Luke 4, John 7, John 8, John 11. All these times people wanted to kill Jesus, but he got away from them somehow because his time wasn't yet. Even after the feeding of the 5,000, you remember that? The people wanted to make him king after they saw him do this. But he did not allow that to proceed, to bring about the confrontation with the Pharisees before his hour came. It wasn't time yet. But now, at this Passover, on God's timetable, his hour had come. So he welcomes the messianic praise of his triumphal entry, knowing what it would lead to. Because it is his time, the hour of his suffering, the hour of his glory, the the hour of his exaltation. You see, Jesus did not, this is so important, church, Jesus did not accidentally fall into the hands of evil men and be crucified against his will. No, he laid down his life. John 10, he says, he says, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. He gave himself over when it was the appointed time for the opposition to make its move in the way the sovereign hand of the Lord had intended. You don't believe me? Listen to this. In Acts chapter 4, when the believers are praying, in verses 27 and 28, they're praying to God, and this is what they said. They said, For truly in this city... Jerusalem. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, listen, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You see, this, this, this opposition to Jesus didn't just accidentally happen. It was the plan of God from eternity past being executed, being carried out. God had a plan of redemption, and he was executing that plan. But the people's praise, it was, it was really misguided. Jesus was worthy of praise as Messiah because he is, but, but their praise was misguided for they had wrong expectations of what Messiah would do. They, they may have expected Jesus to overthrow Rome and set up his earthly kingdom now, but by riding into town on a donkey, he indicated otherwise. You see, he was fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10, which said that Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding humbly on a donkey's colt. 
This prophecy said, Messiah is coming into the daughter of Zion. This is, this is Jerusalem. The daughter of Zion is Jerusalem. Messiah is coming into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. This is a prophecy of what is to come. And here Jesus is acting out that prophecy. He is Messiah. He is coming into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt because he is Messiah. But he didn't come in on a war horse indicating that he had come to do battle with Rome. No. He came on a donkey, indicating he had come in humility and peace. He wasn't declaring war on Rome. He didn't des- deny being Messiah and king. No, he fulfilled the prophecy of Messiah coming in on a donkey. He is Messiah, he is king of all kings. He will defeat all his enemies, church. He will, he does have all authority. He will be given an everlasting kingdom. He will be worshiped and served forever. Oh, yes, he will. But in the way he came, he was indicating that Messiah wasn't coming to go to war with Rome and take that earthly kingdom now. He could have. I mean, the crowd was jacked up. They were ready to, ready to join him. They were anticipating him as Messiah. He could have motivated them to move against Rome to free the nation, but he didn't. His was not a battle against Roman oppression. He came as a humble, peaceful king who would give his life to do battle against sin's oppression over his people, and he would win. So he says down in verse 23, the hour has come For the Son of Man to be glorified, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It was time for Jesus to be glorified, which included his suffering, his exaltation. His glory was on display throughout his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation. The God-ordained hour of Jesus' death was at hand, For it was only through death that he could fulfill God's plan to win salvation for unworthy sinners who would become his children. It was like a grain of wheat. He used the grain of wheat illustration. Right now, it you know, it got really cold last night, so Steph brought all her little plants in. And what she's been doing, she's a gardener, my wife is a gardener if you're in here and don't know that. And she she took little seeds, and there she told me last night she's got more plants than she ever has, and I believe it, because it's filling our kitchen table. And what she did, she took a seed and she put, she put a little seed and a little bit of dirt to get starters started that she'll go plant in her garden. And right now on our kitchen table are just tomatoes and flowers and all little seeds starting to pop up. But what happened was those seeds were put in the dirt and they, in essence, died in the dirt. But from them is coming life that will produce fruit. And what Jesus is saying is like a grain of wheat is planted and dies From it comes fruit for harvest. So Jesus would die so a fruitful harvest of souls will be gathered and saved from sin. William Hendrickson says, apart from the cross, there is no spiritual harvest. And then in verse 27 and 28, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You see, this approaching hour of his death troubled him. It shook him up. It caused him horror. Not merely because of the physical pain he would endure. What caused him agitation of soul was the burden of sin that was going to be laid on him and the furious, terrible wrath of God that would be poured out on him as our propitiation. See, we can't know the depth of suffering that Jesus experienced on the cross. Were you crucified, you would know what crucifixion feels like, but you would never know what it was like to endure the wrath of God for sin. None of us. Jesus is in a class all his own. He's exalted Lord. He's holy. He's God. So none of us knows what it's like to be holy God, 
but bear the weight of the world's rebellion and sin and suffer the wrath of God. We don't know what that feels like, but Jesus was about to feel that, and it troubled him. It caused him horror and agitation. MacArthur says, in his humanness, Jesus felt all the pain associated with bearing the curse for sin. If behold says, his deity did not mitigate his trouble, it rather gave him an infinite capacity to feel it. End quote. As troublesome as this was for him, he would not be saved from this hour, nor ultimately desire to be. For this is why he came to earth. Remember he told, I think it was Peter, and as he was getting arrested, that he could have called angels to rescue him from this hour, but he didn't. He wouldn't do that because this is why he came. All the prophecies of the Old Testament, the progression of God's redemptive purposes, they were about to be realized in this hour. This is why he came. And he knew this. In Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter's like, uh-uh, that ain't going to happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He, Peter's mind's weren't, mind wasn't on the things of God. And, and Jesus would not be deterred from why he came. This is why he came. In Gethsemane, he's sweating drops of blood, seeing what's going to come, uh, 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 anticipating, enduring God's wrath on the cross. And he says, Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, yours be done. He would not give in or shrink back from this hour. He submitted to the Father's will. Why? Because this is why he came. We have a Savior and a Lord who was so devoted to obedience to the Father, so devoted to God's glory, so devoted to our salvation, that he endured the hellish horror of Calvary. He came to be lifted up. He tells us in verses 32 to 33. He came to be lifted up on a cross. He would be lifted up on a cross before he is lifted up to the throne of heaven. John 3, Jesus says in verse 14 and 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Most of you probably know what he's referring to there. He's referring to the time in Israel's past when they, were, they had been grumbling against God and God sent serpents to bite them and then they, were gonna, they would die. But God instructed Moses to, build a, 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 to make a pole with a serpent on the top of it, a, a bronze serpent on the top of it, that if they looked in faith to that serpent, they would be healed if they were bitten. And what Jesus is saying is that those who look to me lifted up on Calvary's cross, trusting in what I did for them, for their salvation, that my death was propitiation uh, for their sin, was enduring the wrath of God for them. If they trust in me, if they turn from their sin and, and trust that, that I died for their sin, and yet they'll have eternal life. This week we had tornado warnings. You know, and we, we, when tornado warnings come, we find those places in our homes that, that will shield us if something is to happen, that if, that if our house were to cave in on us or windows were to break, that we'd be safe and shielded by beams or, or, or doorways or, you know, inside interior walls. Well, Jesus is the one to whom we flee to shield us from the wrath of God. It's almost as if he, that the tornado of God's wrath is coming against sinners, and we are all sinners. All of us are sinners worthy of God's judgment, worthy of God's wrath. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have fallen short of a, of a holy, righteous God who deserves our perfect obedience, and none of us are like that. And so we deserve his wrath. We deserve that tornado to come and sweep us up in judgment forever. But Jesus comes and he bears our sin on the cross. He bears our sin and our shame. He, 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 take, he bears in his body on the tree, First Peter says, our sin. And he, he suffered our punishment and wrath. He was raised victoriously. It was 
completely paid for in Christ. And so all who flee to him, who hide under the shelter of his wings, will be saved. It's almost like he, we, we run into that, that, that place in our house, and if the tornado comes, we're, we're safe. We run to Jesus, and when the fury of God's wrath was poured out on him, it's not poured out on us. Because we repent of our sin and we've trusted in Christ. That's why he came. He came so you could be shielded from the wrath of God and instead experience the favor of God forever. 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is why he came. For this torturous, agonizing, sin-bearing, wrath-enduring hour, he came. Because Jesus was that grain of wheat that died, the resulting fruit of salvation of souls, it's not just a possibility, it's a certainty. Oh, church, hear this. Isaiah 53, 10 through 11, the prophecy of Jesus, listen, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. Listen, he shall see his offspring. Jesus said that the dying grain bears much fruit, not that it might bear much fruit. Jesus is not now up in heaven just hoping people are going to be saved. No. There will be a harvest of souls to salvation because of the work of Christ. God is a people he intends to save, and it is through the death of Jesus that he accomplishes that salvation and gives the redeemed to his Son. John 6, 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Jesus died to save his people, and a harvest of souls is certain. That's why he died. And Jesus said when he is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. Not saying everybody, he's saying people, uh, all, uh, people from all over. Anybody can come to him. He is, John 1 29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Being lifted up on Calvary's cross as the sufficient sacrificial substitute, he will draw people from all tribes, languages, races, and peoples to himself, not merely Jews only. His salvation will go to the Gentiles. This has always been the plan. Jesus said, I've got sheep of another fold I've got to bring in. These are the Gentiles. The fruit of his death, the fruit of his death will be God being glorified and many people from all over the world being saved. Much fruit. These Greeks, we didn't talk about them, but these Greeks that wanted to talk to Jesus can now come to him for more than just an interview, but for eternal salvation. And Christ, through the message of him being lifted on the cross, attracts and draws his people to himself and gives them salvation as a fruit of his sacrificial dying work. You know when you go outside, this happens to me when I go out of the chickens at night, you know, I'm going to get eggs or something or, or taking the trash out to the road and, you know, it's dark out there and I need a light and make sure I don't step on a snake or something and, you know, whatever. And, 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 and you know, I got my light, my flashlight, it's really my phone light, and bugs are just kind of coming all over. We saw that in Africa. We're trying to teach at night in Africa, you know, with the flashlight and it's just, Africa's got these big, huge bugs, right, Mason? You got these big, huge bugs, and it's like airplanes coming and attacking you. It's crazy, but bugs are attracted to the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the, the bugs come. And it's, it, the, Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all people to myself. And what he's saying is, hey, when I'm lifted up on Calvary's cross, the message of my salvation, the message of my sacrificial work for the world is going to be on display and those who are mine will be drawn to me like bugs to a light. Those who are saved have had their blind eyes opened by God to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And they have been drawn to him to trust in him by faith for salvation. So quick 
three quick closing thoughts before we go to the table. The Jewish people and their leaders, they had the scriptures, church. They had the scriptures. They were convinced about the nature of their Messiah. They were convinced about the nature of his mission, but they were certainly wrong. Jesus shattered their erroneous expectations with the truth of who he was and the reality of God's plan and mission. So what does that mean for us? It means, please listen carefully, especially in the day we live in today. It is possible to look at the scriptures and be so wrong about them, but be so certain that you're right. That you end up denying and rejecting the biblical Jesus just like the Jews did when he didn't meet their desires or their expectations. Our preconceived ideas, our desired world views, our felt needs should have no sway in our understanding of biblical truth or its Christ. So may God give us humility with no agenda as we approach the Word of God. Number two, Jesus' grain of wheat parable, it's incredibly instructive to us. But look at verse 25 and 26. After he says the grain of wheat dies and brings forth fruit, he says, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This ultimately is talking about him, obviously, but for us, too. Jesus considered the kingdom of God as a greater priority than even his own life. And those who are not willing to prioritize the things of the kingdom, following Jesus, serving him because of selfish pursuits, worldly pleasures, riches, relationships, sinful desires and actions, or fear of persecution, or even losing your life for Christ, those who don't prioritize the kingdom because of those things, they won't have eternal life. Yet those who are willing to give up anything to prioritize the kingdom, those who carry their cross daily and follow Jesus will have eternal life. Those who follow Jesus will be with him where he is forever, honored by the Father. Those who are like the, the guy who, who, who found a treasure in a field. You remember that Matthew 13, found a treasure in a field? And he said, i got to have that treasure and so he bought the whole field so he could have that treasure. Or the, per, the next verses talk about a guy, a merchant, a, a pearl merchant. You know, he's going and, and, he, and he finds these amazing pearls. And he sells everything he has to buy those pearls. Those who follow Jesus give it all for him. So is there anything you aren't giving up to follow Jesus faithfully? You're not saved by giving up things. You are saved by your faith, but those who are saved by faith start to demonstrate this life in the way they live. And lastly, number three, Christ Jesus died that all people may be drawn to him for salvation. All people, everywhere, no matter their earthly differences or distinctions, everybody has a common need that is their deepest need. So of all the people that you know, every single one of them, you can be sure that their deepest need is not for self-worth, it's for salvation. Their deepest need is not for financial security, it's for eternal security. Their deepest need is not for physical healing of their diseases, but for spiritual healing of their sins. All people. Jesus hung on that cross not to make your life worldly awesome and American dream awesome, he hung on that cross to save you of your sins so you could know him forever. And Jesus is the only one who can meet the deepest needs of all mankind. So we've got to be about proclaiming the truth of our sinful condition that judgment awaits and that God's provision of the lifted up, crucified, risen, exalted Christ is, is there to forgive our sin and rescue us from his wrath. So here's the invitation. The invitation is this, and we'll do this a little bit different today. If you're not a believer in Jesus, 
or you doubt that you are, we want to invite you to the cross today. We want to invite you as one who is wandering in the desert, dark wilderness, lost with nothing there to sustain you. You're spiritually hungry. You're dying. You're dead in your sin. But there in that wilderness, you look and you see a city lit up. And you figure, hey, if there's light in that city, there's people in that city. If there's people in that city, there's food in that city. If there's food in their city, there's health in that city. And there's help. And so you are drawn to that city. We're inviting you as those who may not be saved, to be drawn to the cross of Christ because that is where the rescue and salvation from your dark, sinful, lost condition is found. It's in Christ. So if you haven't trusted in Christ, we want to we encourage you today to come to Christ. He is that city that we must be drawn to. He's that grain of wheat that died for your salvation. And so just right now, before we take the supper, would you bow with me? And if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, or you doubt that you have, but you want to, and you're ready to, I want to ask you even now to just tell that to God. I'm not asking you to rely on a a prayer to save you, I'm asking you that if you want to be saved, just tell God you want to be saved. Confess to Him that you're a sinner. Confess to Him that you know Christ is the only Lord and Savior, that you believe His gospel, that you believe He died and rose, and that through that salvation has been won, that you want to turn from your sin You want it forgiven. You want to follow him in faith. But you're willing to give it all up for him. If that's you. We just invite you in these next moments to just tell that to God. He hears you. you're a believer we're asking you to come to the table today worthily confess your sin right now confess any sin you've been struggling with engage your mind and your heart with what's about to happen Confess now that you need Jesus. And salvation is only through Him. And confess your thankfulness to Him for what He's done for you. Don't come to the table clinging to sin that you stubbornly are not repenting of. Come repentant. Come acknowledging Your salvation is only because of Him. And take the supper today in a worthy way. Jesus was lifted up in apparent shame on Calvary to win your salvation. Only to be lifted from death, raised and exalted to the right hand of the throne of God in authority over all. 
He is Lord and He is Savior. And today, from all over the world, many are lifting Him up as their Lord and Savior. And one day, all will acknowledge Him as such. So knowing that He will be lifted up and serve forever in His everlasting kingdom, over which He will reign as King over all, let us marvel that that King would become a grain of wheat to die so that he may draw us to himself and save us as the fruit of his sacrificial work. Glory to his name.